and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to June 1985 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games, we struggle connecting a real Spectrum to a PC, we review some older games, we take a look at a newer title, and finish off in Type In Corner. But first, it's back to the time machine in June 1985. Ocean Software have signed a deal with Japanese arcade game producers Konami. This will allow the Manchester-based software house to release eight versions of arcade games across several formats, including the Spectrum. Games to watch out for include Hypersports, Tennis, Yaa Kung Fu, Hyper Rally, Golf and Ping Pong. Dixon's, the high street retailer, have announced that they are to sell a Spectrum bundle that will include everything the user needs. The deal will cost £199 and include the new Spectrum Plus, the Sinclair flat screen TV, a ZX printer and the software bundle including Space Raiders, Hungry Horace and View 3D. The move is seen as a clearance of old stock by the high street chain as Sinclair stopped selling the ZX printer a year ago and many of the software titles are quite old. Sinclair have run into trouble trying to finance future projects and maintain profits. Sinclair vehicles, set up to produce the new electric car, the C5, may now have to be sold, which have raised concerns over the future of the company in general. Sir Clive confirmed that the company needed to raise between 10 and 15 million pounds to be able to continue trading. And he also stated he would be stepping down as chief executive, though will continue to be chairman. Sinclair have been given additional credit terms by some suppliers in a bid to help them out. Some, like Thorn, EMI and Philips, have been approached with a view to buying a stake in the company. In a shock announcement later on in the month, it was announced that Clive Sinclair had sold the company to publisher Robert Maxwell, and in doing so, reduced his stake in the company from 80% to just 20%. He also stepped down as chairman. Sinclair Research, the company that gave birth to the ZX80, ZX81 and of course the Spectrum now belongs to Hollis, a subsidiary of Pergamon Press and Robert Maxwell Company. Clive Sinclair wants to form a new company solely focused on research and rumours that he may try to buy Meta Labs with 10% of his stake are circulating. The company, estimated to be worth £130 million last year, is now said to be worth just £12 million. Very sad news for all Spectrum owners, but the company will continue. The 16-bit market is starting to hot up, with Commodore planning to release its new Amiga computer in June, but only in the USA for now. Although the high price, costing around £1,500, may take it out of the range of the average household, it's only a matter of time before prices begin to fall. With Atari releasing their latest machine last month, the 16-bits are certainly going to make a difference to home users. Both machines have built-in high-capacity storage, high-resolution graphics modes, more colours, improved sound, and numerous connectivity options. Could these machines be the future of computing? And will the 8-bit era be coming to an end? That was the news, and now on to the top selling games. New in the charts this month are Starion, the elite-like game from Melbourne House. Spy Hunter, the arcade conversion from US Gold. Minder, a game based on the popular television show from DK Trikes. Tapper, another arcade conversion from US Gold. And Dundarak, a graphic adventure with superb animation from Gargoyle Games. And that was the news and top selling games from June 1985. This little exercise was never intended to be a feature on the show, it was just an experiment to see if I could connect my Spectrum to my PC. I thought, reading online guides and manuals, that it would be fairly easy, but it turned out to be an absolute minefield. The original plan was to connect my Spectrum, with Interface 1, to my PC running Spectaculator and transfer files between them. I wanted to do this as part of the review of the microdrive I did a few episodes back. 
That was a few months ago now, and it's taken this long to get far enough to allow this feature. Also, as I was planning everything for the microdrive review, a fan of the show asked me if I could transfer some of his old microdrive cartridges to the PC for him, and he gave me a box full of games as an incentive. So it had now moved from a bit of messing about into more of a challenge. Sinclair's Interface 1 provides a serial port at the back for connecting printers or modems. The wiring is, rather stupidly, non-standard. What were Sinclair thinking? So my first task was to butcher a perfectly good serial lead and rewire it to match the Sinclair pinouts. Luckily the correct wiring was easily found online, or in the help file of Spectaculator. Once that was done it was ready to connect everything up. And this is where the first problem arose. I discovered that my PC hadn't got a serial port. It's very rare, if at all, I've used them since the days of serial mice, so I had to borrow a USB to serial adapter from work. Once I had that, I had to connect everything up and power everything on. The first thing was I had to set the baud rates on both the real spectrum and spectaculator to match. This was done using the format command, using the B to depict the binary channel and the baud rate. Once this was done, it was ready to try and transfer a program. I had written a small basic application that allowed me to set the baud rate and send itself across the serial link. I set the spectrum to receive. I set Spectaculator to send the file and hit the enter key. The screen went black with flickering white lines and a few seconds later the spectrum displayed the OK message. Wow, it worked! Listing the program confirmed that my little application was now on my Spectrum. I ran it and saved it to Microdrive, and really couldn't believe it had gone so well. Now to try the other way. After all, that was the whole idea. I cleared Spectaculator and reset the baud rates ready to load, typed in the save command on the real Spectrum, and hit enter. And nothing happened. The screen went black, but nothing else. First thing was to check the cable, and all seemed fine. Next I had to check Interface 1. Using the service manual I found online, charting out a few of the pins and running a test program indicated that everything was also working fine. Hmm, interesting. But only left the USB adapter. Not deterred, I dug out my motherboard manual and found it had a serial header. I just needed a bracket. I had one of those in the loft so quickly installed it, plugged everything back in and tried again. I had to use a serial extension lead now because with the port being at the back of the PC, the lead just wasn't long enough to get to my Spectrum. So it was time to try again. Plugged everything in, powered everything up, loaded my app, set the baud rates on the Spectaculator and the Spectrum, and still nothing happened. After many hours of messing about, I was left with only two options, try another PC or rebuild the lead. I opted for the second. I rebuilt it, plugged it all in, and set everything up again. And finally, the program was sent from the Spectrum back to the PC. I can only assume that the plug was dodgy, and it's a good job I ordered two of them. Now I could send programs in both directions. But what of the cartridges I was asked to transfer? Well, they contained development tools and obviously lots of data files, and the problem was that I had no way to identify the file types and how long they were and what format they were in, so I couldn't just load and save as normal. I needed something else. And that's where MDV to IMG comes in. It consists of two programs, one for the Spectrum and one for the PC. In essence, without getting too deep into the technical stuff, the program runs on the Spectrum and it reads the microdrive cartridges sector by sector. Once a few of them have been read, it dumps the raw data out across the RS-232 port. On the PC side, we have a terminal program called Termite with a log file plugin and this just reads any data it receives and dumps it out to a bin file. Reading a cartridge that has a lot of data took over 10 minutes, so it wasn't a quick process. Once it was complete, you had a bin file that needed to be converted into an MDR file so it could be read by Spectrum emulators. Or at least that's the idea. In practice, again I was thrown in at the deep end with very little in the way of precise guides. After changing all the settings in Termite, I finally got it to receive data and create bin files. But these, for some reason, when converted to MDR files, were unusable, showing zero data and no files. 
It was at this point that I became worried, because it took over 10 minutes of constant reading, with the microdrive motor spinning all the time, constantly running the tape loop through, which didn't bode well for 30 year old cartridges. The pads under the tape are fragile anyway, and running them for this amount of time may cause damage. And after the first one, I found this to be true. In fact, I tried two others of my own, and both of them suffered the same fate. It was at this point I held my hands up and stopped. I had no idea what kind of punishment the drive was going through, and whether or not there were any gains to offset it. So, to sum up this feature, if you want to transfer normal basic programs or code, and you know the address and length, then using the RS-232 link is fine, if you know how to do it. If, however, you've got a full cartridge of data that you don't know what's going on, make sure that you've got the process working 100% before trying it on anything of value. Otherwise, you could do more damage than good. Well, that was my lesson learned, and I won't be trying anything like that again in the near future. This is Automania, released in 1984 by Microgen. Subtitled Manic Mechanic, you can guess what type of game this is going to be. This was the first game to feature Wally Week, Microgen's well-used character that went on to appear in many other games. This though, although being a platformer, has a nice twist. The aim is to build cars, collecting parts from one screen and assembling them in the other. Each level has a different car to build, starting with the infamous Citroen 2CV. The music, although nice at first, soon gets annoying, but you can turn it off. Doing so makes the game play more or less in silence, so it's a lesser of two evils, really. The game starts with some funny credits, which you can skip once you've read them, and quickly get to the game. The collection screen has ladders, moving platforms and parts of the car scattered about. It's important not to touch anything apart from the car parts, so there's a lot of jumping involved. The jumps are very short too, making progress tricky, and the collision detection can be off at times, so you have to be careful. Sometimes you can jump too soon, sometimes too late, and it can all get frustrating, until you learn how close you can get to objects before they get you. Once you have a car part, it's back to the garage to add it to your car. Here there are more things to avoid, before you can add the part and get back again for the next one. The graphics are large and well drawn, and despite a little bit of flickering, are really nice. The sound, without the music, as mentioned before, is limited to the collection and death sounds. The pace of the game is slow, and sometimes it can feel very pedestrian when compared to things like Jet Set Willy or Manic Miner, but the urge to complete a car keeps you going. Once you complete the car, it drives off and is replaced by another half-built one, ready for you to go off and get some parts. As each car changes, so do the nasties, and the platform layout of the collection screen. And if all this wasn't enough, there's a time limit to each car too, so you can't mess about. I like this game, but I think it's overly difficult, especially around the collision detection. The collision and jumps coupled with the time limit, and the fact that you can die if you fall, add up to what can be a frustrating game. But I still like it, but that doesn't make it a brilliant game. Why not give it a try? This is Star Runner, released in 1987 by Codemasters. The inlay informs you that you've been selected for the 2087 Olympic event of Star Running. So, what is Star Running? Well, it's a race against the clock over a set distance with added traps and obstacles, a kind of interstellar obstacle course. Level 1 and you have to avoid fire pits and blocks of, well, something really, that send you sprawling in a comical style 90 degree rotation sprite kind of way. There are also certain surfaces that slow you down, and things that send you back a few screens. Because this is time based, you have to choose the best route, while at the same time avoid getting delayed or falling over. There are clocks to pick up that extend your time, 
So aim for those if you see them. The graphics are a kind of 3D that really doesn't help control at all, as you often find yourself jumping too soon or too late, triggering that flat on your face moment, and of course wasting some time. The screen does not scroll, instead it flips, which is also a bit of a pain, as you can't tell what obstacles are coming next, and sometimes run straight into them. Control is good, apart from the fact that the 3D doesn't help anything, but there is a pause straight after standing up having fallen down, so you end up just holding down a key. This of course can have its own consequences, as you can charge headlong into a fire pit. Apart from the flip screen effect, the other graphics are quite well defined and smooth. Sound is very limited to a sort of plink plink sound as you run or fall over, which is a bit disappointing for 1987. I managed to get past the first level quite a few times, and the second level is much the same really, but with different colours and slightly different hazards. The game mechanics are the same though, avoid things that are going to waste any time or knock you down, and try to get to the end as fast as possible. You can see your progress at the top of the screen, and you get told when you're halfway there. I presume this is to add some sort of tension to the game. After about 10 plays, I had no urge to continue though. I wasn't drawn in, and I couldn't care less what the other levels looked like. Somehow the game just falls as flat as the main sprite after tumbling over a block that it was nowhere near. For 1987 then, a bit of a disappointment. This is Beam Rider, released in 1984 by Activision. You are the Beam Rider, protector of Earth, patrolling the restricted shields that surround the planet. Anything that appears in them must be destroyed. Each sector has 15 aliens and a sentinel. You can't destroy the sentinel until all the aliens have been removed, and there is a countdown at the top left of the screen. The intro section is a bit off-putting, but once you get into the game, we get a nice 3D grid effect, and a few aliens flying about. You have two weapons at your disposal, lasers and torpedoes. Lasers are used for most alien types, but cannot destroy the sentinels, and some types of alien. Torpedoes can destroy anything, but you only have three per level, so you have to be careful. So, it's all out blasting then. Brilliant. In the later levels, hitting the sentinel is made tricky by blocking aliens that intercept your torpedoes. Very nasty. You can also get extra ships by colliding with yellow pods, but for some reason I got mixed up in the action and just kept shooting them. Firing is done along the grid lines in a sort of tempest-like way, so you can sometimes predict where the aliens are going to be, and meet them with your laser. The graphics are quite basic, but sufficient I suppose. The main ship is a bit blocky, and really could have been improved, but this game is all about gameplay, and it certainly scores high in that department. The 3D effect is nice, and the control is fast and smooth. Sound is used well, although the constant drone can sometimes get irritating. The game overall, I liked, and I've played this for ages. I can always go back to this game for some more blasting too, despite the chunky graphics, and I always enjoy it. Now, just one more go I think.
This is Terralandia, written by Fabio Didoni and released in 2014. Chilling and terrifying stories coming from the distant kingdom of Terralandia mention dark passageways full of skeletons, bats, witches and vampires. To end this reign of terror, you step forward and enter the kingdom. To complete the game, you have to collect 25 crosses and use them to kill 25 vampires. To kill the vampires you have to jump on their heads, which is a little unconventional, but it seems to work. Bats and skeletons cannot be killed though, and reduce your health if you touch them, so this is all building up to be a typical platform game. There are some differences. Witches block certain entrances, and to kill them you have to use magic cauldrons, again which you have to collect. So in essence you collect everything, avoid bats and skeletons and spikes, jump on vampires, and try and become a hero. This game uses the Chirira engine, that to be honest I've never got on with. This one though proves that a good game, that isn't almost impossible to play, can be produced using this method. The jump mechanism is different from most platform games, and this is the thing that I couldn't get on with. Jumps have varying heights, depending on how you press the keys, but once you get the hang of things, it becomes quite easy to move around. Make sure you collect everything from every screen before you move on though, because you can get caught out. The game is not without its problems too, and there are some areas you just can't get out of. Also a little disconcerting is when you jump from the top of a screen and you appear at the bottom in another room for a few seconds before dropping back. It can get a bit confusing. And also in one room the game freezes for a while, but don't let this put you off. The graphics are well drawn and smooth, and control is very responsive. There's a nice tune that plays on the intro screen, but the sound effects are limited to jumping and collecting objects, and killing things of course. Difficulty is set slightly low, so for average gamers this should be quite easy to complete. And for new gamers looking for something that's not too challenging, this is ideal. You also get a very generous number of lives, 40 in total. But believe me, you do need them, as any contact with spikes, skeletons or bats reduces that by one. All of this means it's easy to play, and easy to progress. Something that I enjoyed, it meant that for once I could see all of the game, without getting too frustrated. It would have been nice to have a little bit of different scenery. The game has three main sets, blue castle interiors, grassy graveyards and red catacombs. All of them are drawn very nice, and the map is designed very nicely and well thought out. Overall then, a great little game that's easy to get straight into, once you get used to the jump mechanism. There are a few little bugs, but apart from that, it's highly recommended. Welcome to Type In Corner. This month's game is Bonfire Party, or Guy Fawkes Night if you look at the code, written by Andrew Bird. This Type In originally appeared in an October 1985 edition of Popular Computing Weekly. The listing took up a full page, with very small text. It's mainly basic but has a few machine code routines for sound effects and screen manipulation. So what was the game like? The idea is simple, move around the screen and collect 8 barrels of gunpowder. Sounds easy, but one battle has a hole in it and leaves a trail of powder behind you. After a short time, this ignites. If this catches up with Guy, it's obviously bad news. He cannot cross his own trail either, or walk into the randomly placed bonfires. Once all the barrels are collected, he can exit the screen and blow up the Houses of Parliament. There's a nice introduction, which unfortunately runs every time you start a new game, but once you get into it, it's not too bad.
You move Guy around the screen as quickly as you can, avoiding the bonfires and trying to collect the barrels. There are a few graphics problems, but luckily they don't spoil the game. Once you collect the barrels it's time to exit bottom right and blow up the Houses of Parliament. Here we see a nice screen effect, which is quite nice, and the graphics from the intro are instantly drawn back to the screen and then blown up. This is all done via the machine code. Then, sadly, it's back to the intro and you have to sit through all this text again. All in all then, an average game with some interesting machine code routines. This is probably the first time this game's been seen since it was published, and it will be available from my blog very shortly. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.